This is our requirement. So it will be dictated more slowly than normal warm-up for this class, but I'm trusting that the material is a little more difficult as well. So we are talking about kind of talking about the musculoskeletal system. So speaking of muscles and ligaments and tendons specifically today. Right. And please stop me anytime if you want something repeated or something. Um, okay. For the record. A striated muscle is one of two kinds which include all the skeletal muscles. Striated muscles are composed of bundles of parallel striated fibers under voluntary control. The heart, a striated involuntary muscle, is an exception. Each striated muscle is covered by a thin connective epimysium divided into bundles of sheathed fibers containing smaller microfibrils. Fibrils. What did I say? Micro? That's not what it is. Myo. <laughs> Sorry. Myo fibrils. Each myo fibril is comprised of thick filaments that consist of molecules of myosin and of thin filaments that consist of actin. That what? I'm sorry. Actin. That, can that consist oh, okay. of actin and two other protein compounds. Muscle contraction occurs when an electrochemical impulse crosses the myoneural junction, causing the thin filaments to shorten. Ligaments are one of many predominantly white, shiny, flexible bands of fibrous tissue binding joints together and connecting various bones and cartilage. Such ligaments are slightly elastic and composed of parallel collagenous bundles. When part of the synovial membrane of a joint, they are covered with fibroelastic tissue, which blends with surrounding connective tissue. Yellow elastic ligaments connect certain parts of adjoining vertebrae. Broad ligament compose a layer of serous membrane with little or no tensile strength extending from one visceral organ to another as the ligaments of the peritoneum. A tendon, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> a tendon is one of many white, glistening, fibrous bands of tissue that attach muscle to bone. Except at points of attachment, tendons are sheathed in delicate fibroelastic 
connective tissue. Larger tendons are extremely strong and flexible, inelastic, and occur in various lengths and thicknesses. Tendonitis is an inflammation of the lining of the tendon sheath and often also the enclosed tendon. The tendon may be the site of primary involvement as a result of a calcium deposit with associated inflammation and irritation also involving the surrounding sheath. The most common sites of inflammation are the shoulder capsule and associated tendons, flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum, hip capsule and associated tendons, hamstrings, and Achilles tendons. The involved tendon sheaths may be visibly swollen as a result of fluid accumulation and inflammation. Fluid accumulation and inflammation or may remain dry but irregularly contoured causing friction rubs felt on movement of the tendon in its sheath. I'm sorry, felt on. Felt on movement of the tendon in its sheath. Localized tenderness of variable severity is present. It may be severe and associated with disabling pain on movement. Calcium deposition may occur in the tendon and its sheath and may be seen by x-ray as calcific tendonitis. Just to make sure. Yes, we are done. Okay, so we will read that back, and I encourage you, if you're using this as practice material, to read that back. We are going to continue our warm up now, um, speeding up and reading part of the uh, Tomas Veronica Cruz um, case back in, I don't know, it's been a while. 2008. Okay. Okay. All right. So we are at special circumstance issues. One, murder of peace officers, special circumstance. Section 190.2, subdivision A7, defines the special circumstance of intentional murder of a peace officer while engaged in the performance of his or her duties as follows. The victim was a peace officer who, while engaged in the course of the performance of his or her duties, was intentionally killed, and the defendant knew or reasonably should have known that the victim was a peace officer engaged in the course of the performance of his or her duties or the victim was a peace officer and was intentionally killed in retaliation for the performance of his or her official duties. Deputy Perigo was, of course, a peace officer within the meaning of the special circumstance statute, working his shift at the Bernie substation and in full uniform in his patrol car when killed by defendant while transporting defendant and Estrada toward the main jail at Reading. Defendant cannot and does not contend that these essential elements of this special circumstance finding were not established on these facts. 
However, it is also a well-established rule that when a statute makes it a crime to commit any act against a peace officer engaged in the performance of his or her duties, part of the corpus delicti of the offense is that the officer was acting lawfully at the time the offense was committed. Defendant contends that his arrest by Deputy Perigo for a violation of Section 647F public intoxication was unlawful because one, he was not intoxicated at the time of his arrest, but was instead found asleep along with Estrada in the station wagon where he was staying in front of the Sanchez residence when first located by the deputy. And two, the station wagon itself was on private property and not in a public place. Claiming his arrest for a violation of section 647F was therefore unlawful, he argues the murder of a peace officer special circumstance must be reversed. We disagree. Section 647F provides in pertinent part, every person who commits any of the following offenses is guilty of disorderly conduct, a misdemeanor, who is found in any public place under the influence of intoxicating liquor in a condition that he or she is unable to exercise care for his or her own safety or the safety of others, or by reason of his or her being under the influence of intoxicating liquor interferes with or obstructs or prevents the free use of any street, sidewalk, or other public way. Contrary to defendant's assertions at the pretrial hearing held to determine the validity of his arrest, it was established through both testimony and photographic evidence that the station wagon in which Deputy Perigo found defendant and Estrada sleeping sometime between midnight and 1 a.m was parked in a public place on the dirt shoulder adjoining Highway 299 and well outside the fence separating Edna Sanchez's property from the highway. Whether a particular location is a public place depends upon the facts of the individual case. A public place includes the area outside a home in which a stranger is able to walk without challenge. Moreover, sitting in an automobile while intoxicated does not, as a matter of law, prevent one from being arrested for intoxication in a public place, nor does being found asleep in a vehicle present an prevent an arrest for public intoxication under Section 647F. Arrest under Section 647F valid where a defendant found asleep in a car at 30 feet from paved roadway. At a pre-trial hearing, Edna Sanchez testified that when she went outside of her residence about midnight to tell defendant and Estrada to stop making noise by racing the station wagon engine, defendant was pretty drunk and slurred his words. Defendant was arrested within an hour of Sanchez's observations. An inebriated person behind the wheel of a car poses a greater danger to himself or herself and others than the same person lying on a park bench. Moreover, although defendant would have us draw an inference that the station wagon in which he slept was not drivable. Such fact was not conclusively established either at the pretrial hearing or at the trial. And indeed the record facts instead support an inference that once a good battery was installed, the vehicle's engine ran loud and strong. We conclude the validity of defendant's arrest for public intoxication, a violation of Section 647F was properly established at the pretrial hearing conducted for that purpose. Alternatively, defendant contends that even if the legality of his arrest was proper, properly established at the pretrial hearing, the evidence thereafter presented at the trial was insufficient to support the jury's implicit finding that his arrest for a violation of Section 647F was lawful as an element of the murder of a peace officer's special circumstance required to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Once again, we disagree. Okay, so that was like 190. You think that's enough of a warm up for you? Can you do like 200, but like jury charge? Just sure. To get like my fingers down. Hold on a second. Okay, switching to some jury charge practice, I'm going to dictate this at 200, or at least I'm hoping to, for the record. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it becomes my duty as judge to instruct you concerning the law applicable to this case, and it is your duty as jurors to follow the law as I shall state it to you. The function of the jury is to try the issues of fact that are presented by the allegations in the indictment filed in this court and the defendant's plea of not guilty. 
This duty you should perform uninfluenced by pity for a defendant or by passion or prejudice against him. You must not suffer yourselves to be biased against a defendant because of the fact that he has been arrested for this offense or because an indictment has been filed against him or because he has been brought before the court to stand trial. None of these facts is evidence of his guilt and you are not permitted to infer or to speculate from any or all of them that he is more likely to be guilty than innocent. Gentlemen, you are to be governed solely by the evidence introduced in this trial and the law as stated to you by me. The law forbids you to be governed by mere sentiment, conjecture, sympathy, passion, prejudice, public opinion, or public feeling. Both the state and defendant have a right to demand, and they do demand and expect, that you will conscientiously and dispassionately consider and weigh the evidence and apply the law of the case, and that you will reach a just verdict regardless of what the consequences of such a verdict may be. That verdict must express the individual opinion of each juror. Gentlemen, you are the exclusive judges of the facts and of the effect and value of the evidence, but you must determine the facts from the evidence produced here in court. If any evidence was admitted and afterwards was ordered by me to be stricken out, you must disregard entirely the matter thus stricken, and if any counsel intimated by any of his questions that certain hinted facts were or were not true. You must disregard any such intimation and must not draw any inference from it. As to any statement made by counsel in your presence concerning the facts of the case, you must not regard such a statement as evidence, provided, however, that if counsel for both parties have stipulated to any fact, you are to regard that fact as being conclusively proved, and if in the trial either party has admitted a fact to be true, such admission may be considered by you as evidence in the case. The state and the defendant are both entitled to the individual opinion of each juror. It is the duty of you, each of you, after considering all of the evidence in this case to determine, if possible, the question of guilt or innocence of the defendant. When you have reached a conclusion in that respect, you should not change it merely because one or more or all of your fellow jurors may have come to a different conclusion or merely to bring about a unanimous verdict. However, each juror should freely and fairly discuss with his fellow jurors the evidence and the deductions to be drawn therefrom. If after doing so, any juror should be satisfied that a conclusion first reached by him was wrong, he unhesitatingly should abandon that original opinion and render his verdict according to his final decision. The attitude and conduct of jurors at the outset of their deliberations are a matter of considerable importance. It is rarely productive of, of good for a juror upon entering the jury room to make an emphatic expression of his opinion on the case or to announce a determination to stand for a certain verdict. When one does that at the outset, his sense of pride may be aroused and he may hesitate to receive from an announced position if shown that it is fallacious. Remember that you are not partisans or advocates, but rather judges. The final test of the quality of your service will lie in the verdict which you return to this court, not in the opinions any of you may hold as you retire. Have in mind that you will make a definite contribution to the efficient judicial administration if you arrive at a just and proper verdict in this case. To that end, the court reminds you that in your deliberations in the jury room, there can be no triumph except accepting the ascertainment and declaration of the truth. If in these instructions any rule, direction, or idea be stated in varying ways, no emphasis thereon is intended by me and none must be inferred by you. For that reason, you are not to single out any certain sentence or indi individual point or instruction and ignore the others, but you are to consider all the instructions as a whole and are to regard each in the light of all the others. The order in which the instructions are given to you has no significance as to their relative importance. At times throughout the trial, the court has been called upon to pass upon the question whether or not certain evidence offered might properly be admitted. You are not to be concerned with the reasons for such rulings and are not to draw any inferences from them. Whether offered evidence is admissible is purely a question of law. In admitting evidence to which an opinion or objection is made, the court does not determine what weight should be given such evidence, nor does it pass on the credibility of the witnesses. Okay, that was a little awkward, but that's done.